Good afternoon, folks. Um, I'm like 5'6", this is like 5'4", so if you don't mind, I'm gonna sort of go out here. I think the dry cleaners at the hotel screwed my order up with my pants and Ricky's, um, but sorry about that. Um, Ricky was right about the, uh, the pressure on the, on the farm out at UBC, though. That t the 23 acres of land that they hold out there right now, they're selling condos uh, on the west side of Vancouver for about $850 to $900 a square foot. So you want to talk about immense pressure on that side, yes. So we won't talk about real estate either. But uh, So yeah, how many people here over the age of 55? No lying, put your hand up. Okay, how many people under the age of 55? Yeah, I see a bunch of liars out there. It, it, you guys, this is actually really interesting because I've been, you know, I give a lot of talks and uh, you guys are a really young, young crowd. So very atypical uh, relative to the demography of Western Canada. Um, and you guys are all much better looking as well. So nonetheless, I'm going to start here and I'm going to start like the other speakers. I'm going to start with my conclusions only because I'm a really tangential thinker. And if I don't get to the end, then you can't fault me for not actually making any conclusions. The demographic and economic changes that we're going to experience in the coming decades aren't going to be simple extensions of past trends. I'm a forecaster, I'm a nerd, uh, I do a lot of forecasting and it, a lot of the times when I look at the economy and the demography and I try and stick those two things together, uh, I come up with an unresolvable future and I'll get into this a little bit uh, later. Work and workers, so the economy and both our labor force, have enjoyed a real blessed time over the past four decades. That's because it's one that's been characterized by a relatively large contributory population and a relatively small beneficiary population. That's the post-World War II boom generation. So lots of people in the workforce, not a lot of people in the retirement stage of the life cycle. That's certainly going to change. Uh, no single approach is going to be sufficient to address both the diversity of opportunities and challenges that are going to arise in the coming years. And this one is a little bit sort of tongue in cheek, ready or not, here it comes. All cities, all sectors, all businesses, we're all going to have to manage a future that is much, much different than what we have all become accustomed to, to this particular point in time. So I'm going to... Uh, take lead from uh, Michael Bloomberg, former mayor of, uh, of New York here, and say, in God we trust, all others must bring data. <laughs> I started by saying I was a data nerd. I'm going to go through 164 slides for you guys in the next 45 minutes. Hold on to your seats. I asked them to put little handles on for you. Um, but that said, my presentation isn't available uh, in its entirety only because I'm on a licensing agreement for some of the data that I have to purchase and I'm going to present. So what I do promise to you guys, though, is if you see something that is in the presentation that you want, the numbers on the data slides are down in the right-hand corner. Uh, write it down, and you can email me at the office. It's just mail at urbanfutures.com, and I would be more than happy to pass the data on to you if I can, and if not, at least let you guys know where uh, I managed or how I managed to acquire it. So, and uh, just by way of that, Bloomberg actually ripped that off as well. It was a statistician named William Deming who, uh, who coined that phrase. So, but he's the one that says it all the time. So, let's start with the history of the unemployment rate when we're looking at this issue of changing people, changing places, and changing notions of, of our workforce. If we look at the unemployment rate in Canada, we look back to 1976 and we can see that from about 1982 on, there was this sort of general decline outside of the big economic fluctuation that we saw through the late 80s and early 1990s, where the unemployment rate came back up to about 10%. And then from that early 1990s period, you can see that sort of general decline down to about 2008. And then what happened? Well, the world sort of went to hell in an economic handbasket from that point. The West showed exactly the same pattern up to that point. All provinces in Canada in and around 2008 actually reached low points, historical low points with respect to their unemployment rates. Uh, Alberta and uh, Saskatchewan were the two lowest in the range of 3.5, 3.8%. Now, from that 2008 period, as the economy shook itself out, we saw the unemployment rates increase pretty significantly, Canada up to just north of 8%, and Western Canada, that's Manitoba westward, uh, about 6.7%. And then once things sort of we actually fared relatively well coming out of that global economic crisis. And, and, and then once we got our feet back underneath us, what happened? Well, we saw the unemployment rate again start to come down. Uh, Canada, by April of 2015, about 6.8%. Western Canada, 5.7%. So you can see over this longer term, there's this general trend towards a decline outside of the economic cycles 
which last about 10 years, we can see this general decline with respect to, uh, to the unemployment rate, both locally within Western Canada, nationally. But if we look at every individual province as well, just about that same pattern, all different levels definitely, but that same pattern of a general decline in, in unemployment rates as we, uh, as we go forward. Oh, thank you so much, sir, appreciate that. So what's going on here? Well, let me ask, somebody can shout this out. Most typical Canadian in 1981, how old? Does anybody want to hazard a guess? Younger, 20 years old. So leading edge of the post-World War II boom was 10 years older than that, so in the range of about 30. Big bulk of people just entering the labor force. So labor force growing more rapidly than what, in, than what employment did, but has upward pressure on the unemployment rates. So if we look to today, 2015, how old is the most typical Canadian? Does anybody want to hazard a guess? Oh, close one over here, 52. So much different context, uh, starting to contemplate freedom 55 and early retirement. And again, that's the most typical Canadian. Leading edge of the post-World War II boom is actually now over 65 as well. So a much different economic, a much different labor force context with respect to uh, the people working in, in the labor force. So as this so clearly shows, we are sort of moving towards a much different period with respect to the relationship between work and workers due to changing demographics. Um, this is going to change all aspects of our labor markets, but more importantly, it's going to change all aspects of how our labor market interacts with the economy as well. As the, the unemployment rate and really slow growth in our labor force across Canada, as specifically in Western Canada as well, has the potential to put the brakes on economic activity in the coming years. I started writing about this back in 2006. Uh, there was a lot of people out there that was, were saying otherwise. This is a quote from David Foote, author of the best-selling book, uh, Boom, Bust, and Echo. Probably a lot of people, I see a lot of nodding heads, a lot of people know, uh, uh, know David's book. If David did one thing in his book that was absolutely fabulous, it made sort of the word demographics a, a household name and made people realize very, very important to track them. Uh, he overstated some of the things, like he said that right in around 2000, between 2000 and 2010, the house, Canadian housing market was supposed to crash as well, but we're talking about real estate again, which we won't. But anyways, David said uh, Canadians outside of Alberta, because Alberta was already really tight, should worry about the labor shortage, but not really quite yet. Uh, national unemployment rate at that point was about 6.4%, and there was no need, there was no national labor shortage, and there won't be one until the end of the next decade, which was about 2010. So, you know, from a long-range perspective, I take a little bit more of a strategic management side of things to say that, hey, yeah, that might be the case. It might be a little bit farther off, but we need to recognize that we certainly have a challenge, because this is a long-term structural challenge that uh, that we're all going to be dealing with. More recently, uh, out of uh, uh, U of, of C, what Canada is arguably facing is a widening imbalance between the skills that the labor market demands and the skills that workers are equipped with, as well as where the jobs are and where the available workers are. The first one isn't really a labor shortage. What they're talking about there is, is a structural mismatch within the economy, which is certainly can be the issue. And with respect to the second one, the mismatch between where the work is and where people are, I just went on for fun because, again, I'm a data nerd, and looked at unemployment in, in Atlantic Canada. This is from the StatsCan's Labor Force Survey. Most recent data show that there was about 119,500 people in total unemployed in Atlantic Canada. But in the last year, the non-Atlantic Canada province had about 128,000 jobs. So there certainly may be a mismatch with respect to shuffling people around, but that scale of unemployment uh, isn't enough to, to fulfill or to sustain uh, employment growth or labor force growth for a prolonged period of time. Not to say that we shouldn't be trying to match people and jobs better, yes we should, but just to say that hey, you know what, we can't dismiss this issue because we think that there's a mismatch between where people are and uh, uh, where the jobs are. So how about you guys, how about the food industry? Well, there's back to the unemployment rate for Canada, and I managed to dig up the unemployment rate for food, beverage, and tobacco manufacturers for British Columbia, only because I had bought the data, uh, and uh, shows that uh, most recent data, about 5.4% unemployment rate. So right on, pretty close to what the average is for, uh, um, for the West as a whole. Now, you can also see that the variance on that sector, really, really interesting as well. In part, that's statistical, relatively small number of, of people working in that sector compared to the economy as a whole. We get the much smoother lines. But it is interesting to see what uh, the, the variation is as we have come through these different economic periods uh, with respect to, uh, to the unemployment rate on the food services side of things. But that's not what I'm here to talk about today. So, 
This I actually found absolutely fascinating as well. This is the age profile of people working in occupations in food processing and service. 850,000 people Canada-wide about uh, working in uh, this sector in 2011. And you can see by far the largest age group, uh, 15 to 24 year olds. Really, really interesting. So if I look and see how that changed, you go back to 2001, a decade earlier, it's 824,000. So right off the top, Canada-wide, net change of only about 24,000 people, that's only about 3% growth. Whereas if we look at occupations as a whole, good indicator of how we, the economy has grown over that period, uh, that's about 13% growth. So the food industry has grown much smaller, uh, or as, at a smaller rate than what, uh, what all occupations have as a whole. The other really neat thing that we can look at with respect to these age-specific data are, oh, actually here, so total recruited was about 318,000 people, and then total losses was about 293,000 as well. So on the top side, we can track and see the aggregate in terms of how many people have, uh, have come in and come out. But what we can do is actually track it on an age-specific basis as well. There's this cardinal rule in demography, and that's, I'm going to tell you a secret. You ready? Just about everybody gets older. It's just about everybody because some people die. So, but nonetheless, we can use this golden rule of demography and look at this age profile. So those 327,235 folks between the ages of 15 and 24 in 2001, well, 10 years later, they all would have logically been where? Between the ages of 25 and 34. Now, what the 2011 data show is that, that those 327,000 folks had been reduced down to only 162,000. Uh, that's about a 50% attrition rate as well. So we can use these attrition rates over time between these age groups to say, OK, well, we know what the 2011 data show. Well, what if we applied those attrition rates to the 2011 stock of folks, let's see how attrition would work on your particular sector and uh, what the implication of an aging population and demography would be. Well, what I found in doing that was that, there you go, let's shift everybody out, everybody 10 years older, and apply the same attrition rates. Total losses uh, between 2011 and 2021 would be about 320,000 people. So that's about 30,000 more than what you guys would have seen in the previous decade. So the big question becomes, how do you guys typically, as an, as an industry or as an occupation, fill that in? It's to hire more 15 to 24 year olds, right? And to fill in that 320,000 at the beginning of that age profile. It becomes even more interesting if I flip it around and say, okay, well, let's look at the population as a whole in Canada by age and do the same thing in terms of aging it forward in my demographic model. What that shows is that by 2021, that 15 to 24 year old age group is actually gonna be about an 11% decline, more than 500,000 fewer kids in that age group. So from a labor perspective, that historical model of you guys being able to hire a whole bunch of 15 to 24 year olds into the industry and lose some of them, 50% of them get on to the next age group, is gonna be increasingly challenged over time. The flip side of this, if you look at the 65 and over age group, well that represents about a 43% increase in the number of 65 plusers uh, in that 10 year period. 2.1 million more folks over the age of 65 Canada wide. Uh, that's a, a, a trend based model from, uh, from our population model, which is very similar to StatsCan's model or from a lot of the other forecasters out there. From the re reality is here that we are moving from the age of labor, lots of post World War II boomers in the labor force, into a labor of age as well. I don't really care how you cut it, whether you say it's structural or not, we are shifting into a much, much different era with respect to our labor force and its composition. So how do you go about managing this? Well, it's my perspective that in order to effectively manage the changing phases of your labor force, you really need to understand what the driving forces are behind those changes. So what I thought I'd do would be to go through some of what those driving forces are and then finish up with some of, some of the strategic management considerations uh, for that. So in moving forward, what are the drivers to your change in your workforce? The very first one is really easy. We've already talked about it. It's aging and birthdays. And a lot of people say that ah, the biggest change is going to be immigration. No, it's actually birthdays. This is something that we can see in the profile of Western Canada. Here's what the age profile of Western Canada looks like to a demographer in 1971. So you can see the most typical resident in uh, Western Canada in 1971, Canada as well, uh, was about the age of 10. So uh, at this particular point in, in Canada's history, young Homer Simpson was uh, the prototypical boomer at, uh, at this time. So the West's working age population is about 5.9 people of working age uh, in 1971, 
per senior citizen or person over the age of 65. So a relatively good ratio. And you can see that they actually deem this demographic dividend. Lots of people working relative to the number of dependents, either over the age of 65 or under the age of, of 15. So what happens if we look a decade later, 1981? Well, the most typical boomer was now in their early 20s, right? Entering a much different stage of the life cycle. There's Homer and Marge, baby on board, just entering family formation, getting into the labor force, establishing their careers, period where Canada housing markets actually grew really rapidly as well as everybody got out of mom and dad's house and into the housing market. So let's jump way ahead to today. There's what we look like in 2014. Most typical boomer is now in their early 50s. Again, entering a much different stage of the life cycle. And now we have an aging Homer as today's prototypical boomer. Guys, that's hilarious. Come on, it's way funnier than that. I know it's late in the afternoon, but I actually, you know, it's, it's, I'm going to digress here for one second. I had a talk and nobody, nobody laughed at that. And I said, okay. I asked somebody afterwards, like, what's going on? And the guy looked at me and said, well, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there you go. Nonetheless, yeah, our reality check, right? Here's what the, the dependency ratio looked like by 2014. It went from 5.9 people working age uh, per senior uh, to, down to about 4.5. So that's about a 24% decline uh, with respect to uh, the number of working people on, relative to the number of seniors. And a much significant change with respect to the dependency ratio, both in Western Canada as well as, as Canada-wide. So the funny thing about this age profile is it's about, just about all regions in Canada share that sort of post-World War II baby boom bulge bulge around the middle, supported by a much narrower base. Baby boom bulge. Come on, guys, work with me here. The jokes are just going to get worse, honestly. So if you don't laugh, like, hey, come on. Um, funny thing about this, Western Canada is a little bit different when we actually look at the profiles, though. So it, there's the West profile. So we can look at, at that West profile, and you can see there's the most typical boomer. But there's actually the most typical resident. And the most typical resident in Western Canada is about 30 years old. Really, really interesting. So if I look at the rest of Canada, it's a much different profile in that the most typical Res the most typical boomer is also the most typical resident. They don't have that secondary bulge in that sort of early 30-year-old age group. Why does the West have that? Well, it's migration, right? We, we actually are a recipient both on the international side as well as significant domestic migration as well. Go West, young man, go West and grow up with the country. This is actually really great. This is from 1911. Washington is not a place to live in. The rents are too high, the food is bad, the dust is disgusting, and the morals deplorable. Kind of sounds like Toronto, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm from back east. I can make fun of those guys all I want. Go west, young man. It's still happening. It is definitely still happening. That's why we see it's not a, a, a boom echo by any stretch of the imagination. It's because we have people migrate out west. And uh, where do they come from? They come from the Maritimes. They come from Quebec. Some of them come from Ontario. Look at their profiles. It's obverse. They have a much narrower stage in that sort of 30-year-old age group. OK, so birthdays. The next one is a, is a really significant shaper to your future workforce is going to be life expectancy now. At the office, we talk about deaths in a demographic context. But you know, when I get out on the road, I like to be happy. So I talk about life expectancy, which is just the obverse of deaths. There's life expectancy at birth in Canada from 1950 to 2013. 78.9 years for males, 83.3 for females. So if we do the quick math on that, that's a 13.4 year gain for uh, males, 13.5 year gain for females. And again, do this simple math on that. That's an average increase in life expectancy of 2.1 years for each decade of life lived over that period since 1950. Absolutely astounding, astounding increases in life expectancy. So guys, if you're listening to me here, if you can get through 10 years, they'll give you 2.1 back at the end. Like, it's, it's cool, man. This is really good stuff. So one other interesting thing about the life expectancies, females' life expectancies are always longer than male life expectancies. Does anybody want to hazard a guess why? No, it's way easier than that. It's called stupidity. <laughs> it starts at a really, really young age. Locomotion. Ah. And then at some point, we wrap it all together. Automobiles, testosterone, and gasoline. It just results in bad, bad news for young males. So popular science actually picked up on this as well. The numbers tell the story of the four, 648 people killed in the US from lightning strikes between 1995 and 2008. 82% were male. Turns out that, well, 
men are just kind of dumb, right? <laughs> yeah. The reality is, age-specific mortality rates, if we look at mortality rates as a result of accidents on an age-specific basis between men and female, males and females, male, life, or male age-specific mortality rates much, much higher through the, the teenage years. It is, honestly, testosterone and gasoline results in things like, you think that's cool? Watch this. Hmm. So, and the neat thing about the life expectancy equation is that if you net them out early, it has a lot of downward pressure on life expectancy. So, but... All of that said, the good news, guys, is we're catching up. Yes, so that's certainly a good thing. Another really interesting thing that's not talked about a lot with respect to life expectancy, which is going to have a significant impact on the labor force, is a declining gap between male and female life expectancies. So it's down to about 4.3 years now, up from about 7.1 years nationally. Uh, it was the early 70s when it started to decline. Um, so we're moving from a situation where like, this elderly notion of an elderly single and an elderly widow is changing into an elderly couple as well. This is an elderly couple from uh, Grand Forks, BC. Does anybody know where Grand Forks, BC is? One person. Oh, really? Two. Look Grand Forks, BC up. These guys are part of BC's green economy. He grows it and she tries to get it down across the border, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Just look Grand Forks up. It's a budding economy. So, but in what reality here is what we are moving into, the post World War II boom generation is moving into, the, there will be the first generation that will predominantly retire with dual pensions. Now, there's two minds about this. One mind says that those dual pensions and the higher female labor force participation rates that we've seen over the last two decades are going to result in a lot of people being financially able to say, I'm out of here. Let's just, 65, we're gone. The flip side is that uh, a lot of people are saying that because people have been active in the labor force, they're going to want to stay for longer periods of time as well. The reality is that, yes, both are going to happen. Um, but what we should expect is that a pretty significant change with the face of, of our labor force because of, of long and increasing uh, life expectancies. And especially long and increasing disability free life expectancy as well and the ability to, to stay in the workforce. Here's our projection of, of life expectancy. Guys, our forecast is for us to pick up about 4.2 years and women about 2.4 years uh, out to about 2041. And that's what uh, the mortality rates are that run our, our particular population model. So there's total population in Western Canada, about 11.2 million people today. So if I just account for aging and mortality, here's where we'd end up at about 8.6 million by, uh, by the end of 2041. Now, it seems like a big number in terms of losses, but the neat thing here is that those long and increasing life expectancies say that almost 80% of us are actually still going to be around by 2041. That kind of freaks me out, actually. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so uh, very, very significant change, again, with respect to the stock of people who are going to be here, with respect to uh, their age and composition working within, within the labor force. So long and increasing life expectancy is going to see a whole schwack more gray hair in our workforce than any other previous generation that, uh, that's come through the workforce as well. And we certainly should be, uh, should be prepared for that. Okay, after life expectancy, I'm going to jump into births. I'm going to talk about births really, uh, really briefly here as well. This came out uh, from the National Post. I love their insightful, uh, their insightful headlines here. Census results reveal the f disturbing fact that Canada is relying heavily on immigration for sustained population growth. I hate to tell them that we're a country that was founded by immigrants nonetheless. Uh, but they think that that could lead to bad things down the road. But, you know, good for the guys at the Post. They came up with a solution. And they're proposing that, well, we just suggest that Canadians go out and start making more babies. Seems pretty simple. So what they're really advocating to all of their 54-year-old white female readers is just go out and have one for the team, right? <laughs> no, ain't going to happen, sorry. So what would cause birth rates to go up? Let's just work with this for two seconds, right? So aging populations are generally going to keep unemployment rates relatively low. We've seen that in the stats. Wages up. Anybody that came through 2008 in Alberta knows the, the impact that that will certainly have. So not a lot of incentive to get out of the labor force because wages are going to be really high. Leaving the labor force to enter the labor force. Get it? Come on, I made that one up myself. <laughs> My wife didn't even help me. That would actually increase the shortage, right? Because it takes mom out of the labor force. And increasingly, what the stats are showing is that dad on parental leave is leaving the labor force as well to try and achieve a better work-life balance. Uh, and it would take at least two decades for these kids to hit the workforce anyways, as we're continually pushing the kids to get more and more and more education, right? So not really a solution with respect to increasing fertility rates, even if we could go and do it. So nonetheless, 
there's births in Canada from 1921 to 2013, and you can see the peak 480,000 births in 1959. Uh, total fertility rate, that's the average number of kids women would have during the fertile stage of her life cycle, from a demographic perspective, 3.94 in 1959. Holy camoles, I'm having a hard time keeping up with a three-year-old, let alone 3.94 three-year-olds. But nonetheless, you can see that from that 3.94 total fertility rate uh, through the 60s, declined really, really significantly down to about 2.4 in 1969. I asked my dad what happened. He said, uh, they invented the remote control channel changer. <laughs> I didn't have to get up out of the couch anymore, right? Yeah. Ah, okay, so then 70s, 80s, in the range of just under one. Uh, early 1980s, mid 1980s, we saw a little bit of an increase, and then the internet came out, uh, back down, bummer. Uh, and then early 2008, we started to see a little bit of a tick up in the fertility rate again as well. iPhone came out, boosh, done. It's, it's all technology. Guys are just way too easily occupied, yes. So, what does this mean with respect to labor force? Well, if we look at that from a demographic context, a population, the base of that population, will grow wider if a total fertility rate is above 2.1. That's when mom and dad just replace themselves. The 0.1 is to account for infant mortality. Any rate below that over longer periods of time, a population, the base will shrink and it will get older much more rapidly. So you can see Canada-wide, we've been in this situation from about, 19, from about 1972. All provinces, all regions in Canada share a very similar profile. So what's happened? Well, what we've seen is the uh, average age at birth increasing very, very significantly in a postponement of, uh, of childbearing into later stages of the life cycle. Now, as a dad in, my, or as a first-time dad in my late 30s, my wife and I are painfully aware of what happens when you don't start this process until very late in your life. Like the time, the clock's ticking, man. <laughs> Outside of that, I have no energy at the end of the day to do anything else. <laughs> So nonetheless, 28.5, we're approaching 30 years old for the most typical age at, at first birth. If I look at uh, all provinces in Western Canada as well, there's how they chalk up. Uh, Saskatoon sits at the top. I, interestingly, Sas Saskatchewan has a, a fertility rate right at the replacement level, about 2.1. Uh, Alberta and Manitoba, both at 1.9. All those, three of those above the national average at 1.6. BC, 1.4. Hmm. Yeah, it goes back to all those pot smokers all the poor little homers are swimming in circles. <laughs> don't, don't, don't. So, uh, yeah. Sorry. It's, it's fun to poke fun at my home. There's our forecast of fertility rates in Canada. Uh, the total fertility rate remaining relatively constant at about 1.6. That's not to say it's not going to change. That's to say that continued postponement. So any increases that we see in those older age groups are just going to be balanced off with declines in the younger age groups as kids stay in the parental home for longer, longer periods of time. It's really hard to have a kid when you're living with your folks, believe me, yeah. Whew. So, from a demographic perspective, I can wrap this into the population and look at what the demography implications would be. 11.5 million, so aging, births and deaths, total population in Western Canada wouldn't really change all that much in terms of its size, it changed very, very dramatically with respect to its age composition as well, as we just wouldn't be filling in on, on the bottom side as we would, uh, or as we have in, in previous generations. Okay, so first, let's quickly talk about migration. So from a migration perspective, I have to step up to the national level and look at Canada as a whole and the components of change. So typically, it's immigration, emigration, and what a demographer would call natural increase. So that's the difference between births and deaths each year. Our forecast is that the immigration rate in the short term, so out to about 2021, is actually going to go up from about 0 0.75, 0 0.76 today to about 0.82, and then slowly decline after that. Why is that? This is the point at which that leading edge of the post-World War II boom, followed by the big, big bulk of the post-World War II boom, is going to start to hit that early retirement stage of the life cycle. And we're going to need to bring in a relatively significant number of people to backstop their aging out of the labor force. If we don't figure it out within the next decade, decade and a half, eh, well, you know what? We're hooped anyway, so that's why we sort of taper off towards the end. I'm being facetious. We taper off uh, slowly because at a rate, the population gets bigger, the number continues to climb. Our immigration number in terms of our baseline is for uh, immigration to go from about 260,000 folks today up to about 325,000 uh, annually in. Now, StatsCan used to run a, a baseline 250,000 immigration, uh, like sort of like an apolitical uh, uh, forecasting tool. Uh, they had to change that about six years ago when the number actually went above 
250,000. They've adopted a similar approach to what we do here with respect to an immigration rate uh, increasing in the short term, in part to compensate for some of these labor issues that, uh, that we're going to see. Emigration certainly going to grow as well. Our forecast is it to go up to about uh, uh, 70,000 net outflow as well, which would lead to net immigration in the range of about 255,000. Uh, a little bit below what we've seen in the recent history, but significantly above where we look back uh, if we look back over the, next, the past decade and two. So from some people's perspective, that would be a relatively robust assumption about immigration. Now, a good number of years ago, about a decade ago, one of the policy objectives in the, one of the liberal red books at the, at the federal level was to, to move towards a 1% immigration rate. So given this at point A2, you can see what the implications would be there. That would be a, a very, very robust uh, assumption about future immigration. So I call this middle of the road uh, assumption about immigration. But look at what that middle of the road immigration assumption does with respect to natural increase. By 2031, natural increase is actually going to become natural decrease. So that's the point at which there'll be more deaths in our population than there will be births. And all net growth in the Canadian population will be as a result of net immigration. Uh, really, really interesting. So you know, there are some significant demographic consequences to, uh, to that level and, and pattern of, of net immigration going forward. So where would Western Canada go once I wrap immigration into that? Well, our forecast is to grow by almost 30%, uh, about 3.2 million more folks. But if I look at that on, a, on an annualized basis, that only represents about 0.9% compound annual growth rate over that period. And you can see how that growth rate would go from about 1.8% today and fall down to less than half of that, about 0.6% by the end of the projection period. Again, the influence of an aging population, uh, a lot more, more mortality at the top side of that profile than, uh, um, than additions to the bottom side of it. Here's what it looks like in terms of the age profile going forward. And you can see much more change at the top side of that profile as it walks its way forward than on, uh, than on the bottom side. So some pretty significant labor force implications here, both for Western Canada. Uh, the profile, if I look at Canada as a whole or the rest of Canada, this is optimistic. Like you look at the bottom side of that and you look at the 20 to 35 year old age group and you know what, it's not a lot of growth, very little bit. If I look at the rest of Western Canada, it's actually no growth or negative growth depending on what region. So Western Canada certainly does have an advantage with respect to attracting that young segment of, of the labor force as well. On the number side, 65 plus and 65 and better, that's more than a doubling, about 166, 1.66 million more people over the age of 65. Prime working force stage of the life cycle, about 20% growth, 1.17 million more workers. And then that uh, zero to 24, the youth, uh, only about 11% growth, 376,000 more kids in that profile. So what would happen to the dependency ratio or the working age population? Well, we'd go from about 4.5 down to about 2.5 and another 44% decline with respect to that ratio. So again, a lot more seniors in our, uh, in our population as well, which by default means that we're going to see a lot more within, uh, within the labor force as well. Here's what it looks like just uh, from our models on, on the regional side. So BC at the top in terms of growth rate, 30%. Alberta, our, our new revision for our forecast is they're about 30%. Their growth rate was just about right on BC's, but given the most recent changes with respect to some of the migration and immigration numbers, they've come down just a little bit. And, uh, and the rest of, uh, of Canada falling in there as well. Atlantic Canada being the slowest grower. So, okay, the last thing that we need to look at in terms of the workforce is we've got all this sort of migration and great on the demography side. What about participation? That's the other big linchpin in all this. You can forecast the demography, but how are people going to, how are they going to participate in the workforce? So there's female labor force participation rates, which is just simply the percentage of females actively involved in the labor force on an age-specific basis. And you can see a very strong life cycle pattern. Low in the 15 to 19 year old age group increases really significantly, plateaus through, uh, through family formation. And then once you hit the age of 54, psh, starts to decline uh, through those older stages of the life cycle. Here's what it looked like back in, uh, in 1971, and you can see, or 76, and you can see very, very significant increases in female labor force participation rates. This goes back to my initial comment about the dual pension households as well. Here's our forecast going forward as well. We forecast most of the increases being in the older stages of the life cycle as well. Uh, some, a little bit of increase through the, the high uh, participation stage of, stage of the life cycle, but most of the increase is coming to the older stages of the life cycle. Again, long and increasing life expectancies. 
on the male side, if we actually look between 76 and 2014, we're a bunch of slackers. Just about every age group saw a decline uh, between that, those, those, two, those two periods with respect to male labor force participation. The good times are over, guys. We're for forecasting for those participation rates to go back up uh, for most of the age groups, at least back to where their historical maxes are. And then for the older age groups, again, like females, pretty significant increases through the older stages of the life cycle. So from a forecasting perspective, this is a pretty robust assumption about how people are going to continue to work in, uh, in the labor force in the coming years. So what I can do is now I can combine the demography and the demographic projection with that outlook for where labor force participation rates are going to go. I can stick those two things together and look and see how Western Canada's labor force is going to change in the coming years. 6.27 million folks actively participating in the labor force today. Our forecast, given the demography and changing, uh, uh, changing participation rates, would be it would increase to about 8 million folks, uh, about 1.7 million additions. It's about 26% growth. Now, if I look at a 30-year period going back, or 27-year period going back, it grew by 57%. So it's still going to grow in terms of looking forward, but going to grow at a much, much slower rate. Uh, its compound growth rate is going to be under 1% going forward, and by the end of that projection period, it's going to fall to below what the rate of population growth is, again, because of a lot of people in the older stages of the life cycle where those participation rates start to fall uh, down to only about half a percent growth. So from an economic perspective, this becomes really, really interesting. There's two ways your economy can grow. You can either add warm bodies to it, the 0.5% growth in the labor force, or you can increase productivity. So most economists would step out and say, we'd like to see real growth in the economy in the range of about 25 to 3%. If that's the case, I'm telling you your number of warm bodies by the end of this projection period or over this projection period are going to grow by between one and a half a percent. We're going to need to see some really significant changes with respect to productivity gains in Canada. Um, we've had some pretty dismal productivity gains historically. That's something that's certainly going to need to change in the coming years if we're going to address some of these issues of, uh, of our aging labor force. So. After 35 years of relative abundance of labor, of labor due to the high birth rates and increasing female participation rates, the next 35 are going to be characterized by a relative scarcity of labor due in part to the low birth rates as well as that life cycle pattern of, uh, of the participation rates. So here and in the rest of Canada, we're going to see a real imperative to match workers' skills and capital, uh, capital substitution. Now, I, I heard the three R's talked about earlier. I'm a product of uh, reduce, reuse, recycle as well. So yesterday's three R's, I see them sort of shifting gears. And today's three R's, it's not reduce, reuse, recycle. It's recruit, retrain, and, and retrain. So the recruitment side of things, that's equivalent to population in my mind. So that's my first R. We have to seriously recognize the impact that immigration is going to have. And I'm back to my forecast being what I would call a, a baseline forecast for, uh, for immigration. But this is going to have some consequences on the face of the labor force out there. Here's a projection of total visible minority population by StatsCan. In 2006, about 16% of the Canadian population identified themselves as being a visible minority. StatsCan's projection is that by 2031, that would be about 31%. Uh, if I look at all of the census metro regions in Western Canada, they range from about 10% in Kelowna up to about 59% in Vancouver. Coolest thing about this is that by sort of by about mid-2021, StatsCan is projecting that the visible minority population in the city, in uh, Vancouver CMA is going to actually be the visible yeah, you guys are good. Yeah, I phone StatsCan. We do a lot of media release for these guys, and I made a joke in the paper about, yeah, StatsCan's going to have to go and change their definition of the visible minority population. We have uh, municipality of Richmond is actually, they've already crunched over the 50% mark with respect to their visible minority population. And the, the representative from the western region of StatsCan phoned me, and he wasn't really happy that I had said they were going to go and change their definition. But nonetheless, like I said, tangents. Rule of thumb is that, generally speaking, just about all regions in Canada are going to see about a doubling of their share with respect to the visible minority population uh, within their community. Now, the 63% in Toronto, the 59% in Vancouver, those look like the big numbers. But I would argue that it's like the Saguenay's, where you're going to go from the visible minority population being 0.5% of, of their population to over 2%. Those are the regions that are going to see some pretty significant changes with respect to uh, the face of, uh, of their labor force and the face of some of their communities as well. So some interesting challenges there as well. There's the new face of, uh, of your labor force with respect to filling in those younger stages of the life cycle. 
So this has a whole bunch of implications on how to deal with the next generation of the workforce. Here's an example of stand-ins. Stand-ins is a Calgary-based manufacturer of automotive parts. They make brake parts and stuff. About 550 people employed. This was a couple of years ago. About 60% of their workforce were immigrants. And to get full ISO certification, about 200 of its employees underwent language training paid for by the company. Part of it actually happening on company time as well. Um, Standin said that you know this is going to expect to improve safety, certainly in the workplace, uh, quality of their product. But interestingly, they were actually speculating that it was actually reduced turnover as well uh, to try and hold on to the labor force in a very competitive market here in Calgary leading up to 2008. So a really, really interesting approach to, uh, to looking at issues of changing workforce and uh, uh, changing face of the workforce. Full sponsorship versus temporary foreign worker and work permit programs. Um, I would agree with uh, this council in Edmonton. The federal government was was basically using the TFW program to replace the immigration program. We need more permanent people to come to Alberta, work in Alberta, and make homes in Alberta. That's true for Western Canada and Canada as a whole. Uh, in our model, we actually, uh, the temporary foreign workers, they're called non-permanent residents, uh, and we actually taper them down to zero over about the next decade in terms of the net changes. Uh, still temporary foreign workers here, but just in terms of the net changes, as we figure a lot of those streams will be put into the formal immigration stream, and uh, a lot of those programs will change pretty significantly over time. Okay, so we also have to hang on to the kids that we have from a population perspective, right? Now, I've said that we've been recipients in Western Canada of, of the Eastern kids. It certainly is the case. Uh, here's New Brunswick complaining that out-migration has left gaping holes in some communities. But the same can be said for some of the smaller rural communities without, within a lot of the Western provinces as well. Uh, as the migration patterns show, that you move from the small rural communities into the big metropolitan regions as well. So we can certainly feel these issues on a small community by community basis as well. So there's some of the issues with respect to recruitment and population. How about retention? And that's participation. We need to certainly better engage people who are not currently in the workforce, people that are being held out of it for any particular reason. One really significant group here is Canada's First Nations. If we look at labor force participation rates and unemployment rates for Canada's First Nations, Aboriginal status, much lower participation rates than what the non-Aboriginal population is. And of those actually participating in the workforce, much higher unemployment rates. So certainly a population group that's be currently being held outside of the workforce that could be better engaged and, uh, within the workforce Canada-wide, not just with respect to Northern Canada. People with disabilities, exactly the same pattern, much lower participation rates, and of those participating, much higher unemployment rates. And we see exactly the same pattern for recent immigrants as well. Uh, lower participation rates, much, much higher unemployment rates through all of those age groups. So we're going to certainly need to do a, a much better job at engaging all of these groups. One of the bad labor force jokes is where's the best place in Toronto to have a heart attack? It's in the taxi cab from the hotel to downtown because your cab driver is probably a cardiologist, right? <laughs> Bad one. Yes, sorry. I told you the jokes would get worse. So we certainly need to get, engage people better or in, not currently in the workforce, but we need to keep people working for longer as well. This is back to some of the long participation rates that we, or older participation rates that we were talking about. Here's a company, Sodexo employees about 50 and older are three times more engaged than younger employees and their retentions are 100 times better. Their data confirm why they want to hire and retain older people within their workforce. But there's another perhaps more pressing reason that our employers are focusing on these age groups because they make up, will make up a growing share of, uh, of the population in the country's workforce in the coming years. So here's Canada's 65 and better labor force participation rate. So you can see in that sort of 1990 to 2000 period, they were relatively flat. Then we hit 2001, and man, did they take off. Big, significant increases in uh, labor force participation rates. 65 to 69-year-old males, that's a, just about a doubling since 2001. Females, it's almost 160% increase with respect to the proportion of females participating in the workforce. So this isn't a result of the financial crisis of 2008, because it started way back in 2001. Long and increasing life expectancies, and that declining gap between male and female life expectancies prompting people to be able to stay in the, in the labor force for much longer periods of time than what they have historically. Motivated seniors are increasingly really viewing their, their golden years as a new beginning. Retirement at 82, I don't have time. 
funny enough, this is actually my father-in-law. He's now 84, works as a small food processor making organic frozen croissants in the Lower Mainland. Still at the office four days a week, if you can believe that. Yes, blowing my mind. But how that segment of the population is engaged in the workforce is changing significantly as well. There's part-time work in Canada, 31% growth uh, since 1997, but there's part-time growth as a personal preference. So the economists always say that part-time work is bad with respect to economic activity, not if you choose to do it. If I look at that 50% growth in part-time as a preference, it's all in the older age groups, 55 plusers. So if I look at self-employment statistics by age, exactly the same pattern. So people are engaged at, on a part-time basis. They're doing what they want the rest of the time. Taking the winters off, going south, and coming back during the summer times and consulting and having a good time and uh, uh, still participating in some form or another. But remember, everybody does end up retiring someday. So retention. Retraining is the last one that I'm quickly going to go through because I am out of time. Specialization, Ford in the assembly line. This is, everybody knows this. Any model you want, any color you want, as long as it's Model T and as long as it's black. That was Ford's tagline, right? The assembly line was actually a mo modeled on a disassembly line. It was uh, a slaughterhouse. That's where Ford got his idea, not to assemble stuff, but watching people take meat, uh, particular specialized pieces of meat off of the carcasses as they went on a chain around. And that's what, uh, what the, the impetus for that was. Capital substitution, push the work off onto a machine. We, Ford certainly did this as well. There's today's uh, version of Ford's production line. It's all done automated by and large, it's robots. So you can certainly capital substitute as uh, the economists say. But another interesting one is worker substitution. This one isn't really talked about and that's just push the damn work back off onto the consumers, right? Uh, the ultimate image of this is the gumball machine. It's the very first digital machine. You put your penny in and you turn the handle with your digits. <laughs> Bad jokes, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, but you know, Ikea did this as well. They revolutionized labor. They're not packaging furniture into those boxes. They're packaging labor into those boxes. And it's in the form of those stupid little Allen keys. Who puts them together? You guys do. Absolutely revolutionary. Air Canada, uh, who checks in at a wicket now with a, with a travel agent? Nobody. And then the food industry is actually doing this as well, where we see you order your own food and uh, you pick it up at, uh, at the end. So even the service-based industries are starting to see this as well in terms of uh, worker substitution. This is the last one, and it's a, a little bit of an elusive one, and it's an all trans knowledge transfer. Connections, innovations, and what I call the division of labor. I'm going to take a little bit of a page from LinkedIn here and connections in terms of a social media. Everybody talks about the younger generation and how important it is for the younger generation to be connected to their peers and to network over over time and, and, and the strength of those connections and how it can, that can lead to innovation. I'm actually going to say my image of this, what I think is, is more important than that is knowledge transfer 3.0 and that's actually just transferring the knowledge within your own organization. It's going to be increasingly important to figure out how to tap the older guys in your organization and download that data in a really efficient manner to the younger generations before you lose them. So do you remember when we had USB 2.0? That was like doubling the speed of your little USB keys. This is a, a new knowledge transfer with respect to moving that knowledge into, uh, into to further generations. So my conclusions, Western Canada, the rest of North America, we are entering our third great demographic transition, characterized by the aging of the post-World War II boom generation into retirement. And this is going to change all aspects of our work, our workers, and most importantly, our workplaces as well. So I thought I'd leave you with five really quick adaptive principles. Every organization is going to have to develop strategies that reflect their own particular circumstance and culture. A producer in Calgary or Edmonton or the Lower Mainland is going to be dealing with much different labor issues than somebody in Hinton or in Regina. So you have to recognize your, your local context as well. There's no one-size-fits-all solution. I heard that earlier as well. So the second one, given the diversity of change, no single strategy is going to be sufficient. Multi-track and evolutionary approaches are going to be required. Why is that? Well, as an organization, as soon as you adapt and get above the crowd, what's going to happen? Well, everybody's going to tag along as well and use your particular innovation. So you've got to be on your toes uh, in dealing with a lot of these issues. Every approach is going to be associated with its own costs and benefits, traditional cost-benefit analysis. You guys are going to have to sit down and look at the numbers to see where and how to most effectively apply some of these strategies. 
No short-term solutions to long-term structural change. That's what we're dealing with, long-term structural demographic change and economic change. And the last one, I absolutely love, simple solutions are only fitting for simple problems. This is not a simple, simple problem, so there will be no simple solution. And finally, a quote to follow off on, it's my favorite of all time, Sir Charles Darwin on managing to change, and ironically, managing to change, not just managing change. Darwin said it's not the strongest species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones that are most responsive to change. And that's what we're going to be dealing with in the coming years. So I thank you very, very much. I'm five minutes over, but you know, you guys did really well, 164 slides. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>